coming up, a classic song that everybody sings along to. But after decades of singing along to it, none of us are sure exactly what we're singing. <laughs> is it a bunch of gibberish or does it mean anything? Well, the FBI sure thought so. They put it on their most wanted list and the song and the band were under surveillance for years. It was banned from radio. It only cost 50 bucks to make and it's one of the most played songs ever. But are the lyrics lewd? Is there really an F-bomb in them? Or is it all a big misunderstanding? The story is so compelling. It's a barn burner. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever called up your favorite radio station and requested or even dedicated a song to anyone, you're going to dig this channel. Potent nostalgia every day. Make sure to subscribe below. Click the bell. You don't miss out on our, our daily content. Also, check out our Patreon for even more content and to help this uh, to be a daily channel. And you can see our new merch right up here, including our 1967 Vintage Years collection. So it's time for another edition of our series, Number One in Our Hearts, where we break down songs that are no doubt about it number one hits, but due to mysterious circumstances, it came up short. This one is as close as one can get to that coveted number one spot, the number two. Uh, it's an all-time American classic. It's been covered so many times, I think that history's probably lost count. And despite being largely amateurish, uh, one of those covers has actually surpassed the original to become the most definitive version. If you haven't guessed it by now, I'm talking about Louie Louie by The Kingsman. Now, it was originally written in 1955 by R&B singer Richard Berry. heavily influenced by a few different songs, including Chuck Berry's Havana Moon. Havana Moon. It's also influenced by uh, Fred Astaire's version of One For My Baby and One More For The Road, one of my favorite songs of all time. I like the Sinatra version better. Make it one for my baby. Lyrically, uh, it took a cue from the latter, which featured a customer conversing with a bartender. Richard Berry named his songs Bartender Louie. The song's protagonist converses with Louie, telling him about his girl back in Jamaica and how he needs to catch a ship, you know, to go see her. After Richard Berry and his group The Pharaohs released the song in 1957, it became a regional hit in the Western US, even though it was actually a B-side to You Are My Sunshine. Louie Louie was uh, later re-released as an A-side single, but this version never appeared on the Billboard Hot 100 or the R&B charts. The single sold about uh, 40,000 copies. I say me gotta go. After a series of unsuccessful follow-ups, Barry actually sold his songwriting rights for $750 to the head of Flip Records, and he left the music industry altogether. However, in 1960, Aspiring star Rockin' Robin Roberts found a copy of Louie Louie in a Seattle record store bargain bin. Uh, Roberts immediately recognized the genius of Louie Louie and adopted it as a theme in his various bands. Backed by the Whalers in 61, Roberts actually cut a version for a local label etiquette. Roberts' version was the first to feature the iconic phrase, let's give it to him right now. Oh, I said, we gotta go. I mean, that line breathed new life into the song, but to be fair to Barry, it doesn't make a lot of sense since it has absolutely nothing to do with the context of the lyrics. Now, Robert's version caught on all around the Pacific Northwest. It was played by a number of bands, including two rival bands near Portland, Oregon, The Kingsman and Paul Revere and the Raiders. During an intermission at a local show, the audience danced to one song from the jukebox over and over again, Louie Louie by Rockin' Robin Roberts. Now seeing the response to the song, both bands immediately added it to their sets. Now the Kingsmen were not as big as the Raiders. You know, they were a group of teenagers who'd formed a few years earlier. And even on a good day, they were still Portland's uh, second best band. 
The core of the group was centered around the friendship of lead singer Jack Ely and drummer Lynn Easton. You know, they had grown up together and uh, their families were close. That's how they knew each other. Now, waiting to capitalize on the popularity of Louie Louie, the Kingsmen went straight into the studio with DJ Ken Chase and they cut their version. Uh, this was on uh, April 6, 1963. The session cost 50 bucks, and the teens could barely scrounge up enough to cover it. Uh, they did their best to copy Rockin' Robin Roberts, but the result was uh, shockingly substandard. This was due to a few factors, not the least of which was that they were just inexperienced teenagers. But apparently the night before the guys had performed a live set of just Louie Louie without any breaks, it was the first known uh, all Louis marathon. Some sources say the set was 90 minutes, others say it was only 45. But regardless of the length, Jack Ely's voice was shot from singing that song so much. If that wasn't enough of a problem, the budget studio only had three microphones. Uh, one was on the bass drum, uh, one was on the guitar amp, and one placed overhead to pick up just everything else. Ely remembered the mic being several feet above his head. Uh, forcing him to stand on his toes, you know, leaning his head back and shouting loudly so that he could be heard over the guitars and the drums. The result was a, a garbled, semi-unintelligible set of verses. The same ones we have all come to love over the years. But there were other issues as well. Uh, at one point early in the song, Easton clicked his drumsticks together by accident and yelled a four-letter word loud enough to be caught on tape. I mean, at another point, after the solo, Ely comes back in at the wrong place and then stops and starts up again. For a quick fix, uh, Easton actually improvised a drum fill. The error is now so well known that multiple versions by other groups have intentionally duplicated it. I think that's so cool. In the end, the Kingsman's version was, uh, how can I say this, a hot mess. Jerry Denon, the owner of the tiny label that released it, tried to get Capitol Records to pick it up, but they thought it was garbage. Unfortunately, so did all the other labels, and that was basically the end of the initial Kingsman's run, if you can even call it that. So later that summer, the drummer Easton decided to sing lead and then switch Ely to drums. Not a smart move since Easton couldn't sing and Ely couldn't play the drums. The rest of the band objected, argued about it, and uh, eventually left. But the end of the Kingsman was only the beginning for Louis. It wasn't long before Boston DJ Arnie Woo Woo Ginsburg uh, heard the song and featured it on his uh, worst record of the week segment. In town, old aching adenoids, Arnie Ginsburg, woo woo, for you, you on the night train. He was the most popular DJ in the area, so it got a lot of local exposure. Now, after playing Louis only twice, calls started coming in from record shops. I mean, customers were desperate to get their hands on this mystery song. That was so great about back then is you couldn't immediately hear it and stream it. You had to go out and find it. Uh, Marv Schlachter uh, at Scepter heard from distributors how well the record was doing, so he picked it up for national distribution on their Wand uh, subsidiary. In his first week, Louis Louis sold 21,000 copies in Boston alone. By December 1963, the once maligned single reached number two in the U.S. charts. What was going on? There's no doubt that Louis Louis's popularity and legacy are indebted to the controversy surrounding it. From the get-go of the Kingsman's release, uh, people were either trying to find dirty lyrics in the song or adding their own to it. Jack Ely had slurred the lyrics so incoherently <laughs> that people, young and old, were certain he did it to cover up obscenities. Mass confusion about the song's uh, true message uh, ensued all over the place. Everybody had to ask the question, was it a CD story about sex or was it a fun and innocent dance song? The uncertainty only drove up Louis' popularity even more. 
A scene from the 1990 movie Coupe de Ville perfectly sums up the confusion, the debate, and sheer bullheaded determination that have surrounded this song uh, ever since the Kingsman released it. I don't know if you remember Coupe de Ville. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's about uh, in the summer of 1963, three disagreeable brothers are driving from Michigan to Florida to deliver a 1952 convertible Cadillac Coupe de Ville to their mother. Uh, midway through the movie, Louie Louie comes on the radio. One of the brothers, Bobby, starts singing along, Oh baby, you go way down low. Louie Louie, oh baby, got you way down low. His brother Buddy protests that those aren't the words. Bobby is adamant that they are. It's a hump song, he says. I got you way down low. Those are the words. It's a hump song. It's a hump song. When you hump. Buddy fires back. Those are not the words. It's about dancing. Do the Louis Louie. It's about dancing. The song is a dance. Louis Louie is a dance. Do the Louis Louie. The conversation gets more convoluted from there with both brothers arguing back and forth. And finally, the oldest brother, Marvin, has had enough. He calls them both morons. It's not a hum song. It's not a dance song. It's a sea shanty. He's talking about going to sea and leaving his girl. Sea shanty. Talking about going to sea and leaving this girl. But of course the other brothers have already made up their minds and the argument continues unresolved. It's really the best scene in the movie and it makes a great point. It puts you right back in that moment of time. I like how they do that. Seems like everyone has their own interpretation of Louie Louie. And whether they're right or wrong, it isn't what's important. The song itself symbolizes how music is open to individual interpretation. Even the artists and the singers say that all the time. He's saying, three nights and days, I sailed the sea. You are so foolish. As airplay increased, the rumors escalated. And without printed access to the true lyrics, the group all but assured that confused and imaginative listeners would find the song salacious. Now this might have been all in good fun, uh, for the rising generation, but parents and authority figures labeled it an immoral scourge. Uh, in Indiana, Governor Matthew Welsh declared the song pornographic. And in early 1964, the Indiana Broadcasters Association banned Louie from the state airwaves. These allegations of indecency led to an extensive two-year investigation by the FBI. The search for proof that uh, Louie was dirty had gone federal. Sounds like an absolutely ridiculous waste of the FBI's time and resources, and it was. The whole thing was a train wreck in the making. But the Bureau justified its actions by saying that if Louis was lewd, the creators and promoters were violating laws against the interstate transportation of obscene material, or ITOM. Throughout the process, the FBI received letters from concerned citizens who were sure that the song was absolutely filthy. In fact, one parent wrote, My daughter brought home a record of Louie Louie, and I, after reading that the record was obscene, I proceeded to try to decipher the jumble of words. The lyrics are so filthy that I cannot enclose them in this letter. <laughs> I would like to see these people, the artists, the record company, and the promoters prosecuted to the full extent of the law. <laughs> I've heard this before. This is like the satanic panic of the 80s. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so there was another account that described an unsuspecting woman purchasing the record in Indiana. Sometime later, acquaintances told her that she could hear the obscene lyrics if the record was played at 33 and a third speed. A co-worker gave her a type sheet of lyrics allegedly transcribed from the record played in this manner. After trying this for herself, the woman concluded the lyrics matched the words on the sheet. So an FBI lab was asked to determine their authenticity by making a comparison. Of course, there was nothing to find, but what was perhaps most concerning were the assumptions the FBI were making. According to the documents that have been released, at no point did they interrogate the woman who complained or the coworker with the dirty lyrics or anyone else involved. So instead of investigating the claims, the FBI accepted them without question. 
It's clear they were determined to criminalize the Louis from the outset. Never once did they catch on to the joke surrounding the song. In fact, they became a joke, wasting American tax dollars by the busload. The FBI investigation went on for two years, like I said, spanning offices in several states. Technicians listened to the song at different speeds, trying to discern the lyrics. At one point, the FBI procured a copy of the original master tapes from Scepter Records, but they were surprised to learn that it was in mono, so they were unable to uh, isolate the vocals. <laughs> Agents even grilled the song's originator, Richard Berry, record company executives, DJs, and members of the Kingsmen. Berry was told that he could go to jail, but he stood his ground and maintained that he hadn't committed a crime. It was crazy. The Kingsmen insisted that they sang nothing lewd, though, of course, that was only a half-truth. An F-bomb was dropped uh, when there was an obvious mistake at the end of the instrumental section. Ironically, though, the FBI managed to miss the one actual obscenity that was present in the song. <laughs> So two years later, the feds had absolutely nothing to show for all of their efforts. Their conclusion? The song was unintelligible at any speed, so no obscenities could be verified. Apparently, they were the last to figure it out. Whatever Ely sang in the studio, what his audience believed it heard was far more important and far more powerful. Well, another unsurprising waste of taxpayer money and government overreach. Not much has changed. Another interesting piece of history on the song is that by the time Louie Louie had gained national popularity, um, like I said, the band wasn't even together anymore. As has happened time and again, there were actually two rival editions of the band after that. One with singer Jack Ely and one with uh, drummer Lynn Easton, who used to be friends. Uh, Lynn Easton had the rights to the name of the band because uh, in 1964 they came to an agreement that Lynn could own the Kingsman band name, but that all pressings of the original version of Louie Louie after that would have to say lead vocals by Jack Ely. The song continued its popularity into the mid 60s, uh, in the 66. The album spent 131 weeks on the charts. However, the band didn't get paid royalties for the song from the mid-60s on, and they didn't own the masters. Finally, in 1998, a protracted lawsuit which had lasted like five years and cost $1.3 million. Um, after that, the Kingsman won the ownership of their recordings. Jack Ely sadly passed away in April of 2015. Over the decades, Louie Louie has made a sizable splash in popular culture. It has shown up in so many films and TV shows, I can't even say them all, but I'll give you a little sampling. Uh, National Lampoon's Animal House in 78, that was probably the biggest. The Wonder Years in 88, uh, Quantum Leap in 90, Cope de Ville as well, Full House. Oh, baby, I said, oh, we gotta go. Shh, kids are sleeping. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beverly Hills 90210, The Simpsons. Party down. Yes! Twice, Mr. Holland's Opus. <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, My Name is Earl. Friday Night Lights and uh, Night and Day. Uh, that was in 2010. So many movies it's been used in. Louie Louie is also one of the most officially covered songs in modern history. I became a party band staple in the 60s, and in 1966, the Sandpipers took it back to the charts with a folk rock version. That one went to number 30. It's also covered by Paul Revere and the Raiders, uh, Otis Redding. Beach Boys, The Kinks, Led Zeppelin, Motorhead. Barry White, Tina Turner, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. Pop. 
Pop, Neil Diamond, Demi Moore, The Smashing Pumpkins, Dave Matthews Band, and Billy Joel. Bruce Springsteen has also had a long history of playing it live. Also Blondie and Tom Petty as well. In the early and mid 80s, California radio stations KALX in Berkeley and KFJC in Los Altos Hills, they each staged Louis marathons lasting several days each. All kinds of oddball renditions were featured by famous musicians and local wannabes alike. And in 1985, it was officially proposed to make Louis Louis the Washington State song. Fortunately, the Washington State Legislature uh, voted down the resolution. So I remember when I was a kid, there was this popular radio station and we all listened to it. One day we were listening and they played Louie Louie. And then they played it again and again and again over and over and over. We thought that you know maybe someone at the station had gone outside for a smoke break and it was just on repeat or something. Well, they played the song over and over 24 seven for like days. And the rumors were just starting to fly. After four days uh, at my school, everybody had a story. One was that aliens had taken over the station and that Louie Louie was you know, their way of communicating with earthlings. Another one that I heard that was uh, the popular morning DJ, he left his wife for a younger woman and that his wife was so incensed that she took uh, that DJ hostage and made him play the song over and over again because he hated it so much. She did it as torture. There was another kid who told me that his dad was in the military and that they were using the song as a code to you know, prepare the nation for nuclear war. So I was telling my dad about it and uh, he's, he turned the station and sure enough, they were playing it. He said, look, none of these are true. And he actually knew the guy that owned the station because he was a painting contractor and he'd worked on the remodel of the offices uh, about a year before that. So he picked up the phone, he dialed the front office of the station and it turns out that they were just changing formats. And while they were making the transition, they decided uh, it'd be funny to play the song over and over again. They probably got the idea from the California stations. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's one of those legendary tales from my small town that's told over and over again. I mean, they ended up playing it nonstop for like a week and a half. And you know what? I never got sick of it. Leave us a comment about the Kingsman and Louie Louie, this classic song. What are your memories of it? Uh, did they ever have any marathons where you were, where they played it over and over again? Let's share our stories about Louie Louie below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Also check out our new merch up here at professorofrock.com. Also check out Patreon in the description. Both these things help us keep the music alive. That's the idea. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe.